I'm Amanda Walker and you're watching IMF Today, live from the annual meetings here in Washington, D.C. Day five, let's take a look. Policymakers have an incredibly narrow path to walk. There is no room for missteps. Peace is the most important economic policy tool right now. Many countries find themselves being pushed close to the edge. In fact, 19 of the region's 35 low-income countries are now in, at high risk of debt distress or in debt distress. The needs are urgent and uh, you are not only responding, but you are setting up a great example for others to follow. It's 5 p.m. in Washington, D.C., and time for IMF Today. All week, we've been bringing you the big headlines from the 2022 annual meetings. And today, things wrapped up with some of the most important official business of the week. You can see behind me, the last seminar is coming to a close. It was about central bank digital currency. And joining me now is Tommaso Mancini Grifoli, one of the IMS experts on this. So CBDC, remind us, what is it? <laughs> CBDC, it took me a while to learn the, the yeah. acronym uh, and to be able to say it, uh, is think of it as simply digital cash. Mm. So it's money issued by the central bank in digital form that you and I can hold on our wallet and transact by sending it to each other or to a merchant. So it's the future. Decreases cost of payments, okay. makes it easy, uh, makes it fast. Right. What have you heard on this panel that excites you, that surprises you? Tell me your highlights. So this was an incredible panel. Uh, incredible speakers and I think the highlight the first highlight is that there is some good news in the world of financial inclusion and this is uh, wonderful uh, at a time when there's lots of bad news yeah. uh, there's some good news financial inclusion starts but doesn't end with payments of course but it's important to realize that payments are kind of the first step in the ladder to financial inclusion once you're included in payments, then you can access credit, investment services, etc. So it's important to get you into this ladder. Um, financial inclusion starts but doesn't end with CBDC either. Mm. But CBDC helps. So let's try it. Let's give it a try. And the idea is that CBDC is not a panacea. It doesn't solve all problems. There are some hurdles that it can't uh, necessarily overcome, such as the desire for informality among uh, uh, payers, uh, the lack of literacy, economic literacy. Uh, but it can overcome hurdles such as uh, costs of accessing financial services. It's very easy to hold currency in digital form on your phone. And in fact, many people have phones. Many more people have phones than have bank accounts around the world. So that's a good start. Um, CBDC also needs complementary services. So countries need to develop, for instance, national digital IDs in order to onboard users to be able to use the application for CBDC. Once that's done, CBDC works and can help financial inclusion. So you hosted an event called New Economy earlier today. What does the future look like? How are we all going to be making payments? Right. Um, so the seminar was also fascinating, and it was about, it was about a dog and its tail. Mm. And the, the, the takeaway was that to now, the tail was wagging the dog. Let's go to the dog wagging the tail. Right. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, uh, the takeaway was that uh, we've been very focused on payments and paying for coffee. Uh, we've become enamored with this idea of digital cash in our pocket to go pay for coffee in the morning. That's because we all get coffee in the morning. We're all consumers. We're all retail consumers. So we like the idea. We think it's cool mm. to go pay with our digital currency. But actually, there's a whole other world out there, the world of financial assets that are likely to be tokenized, to appear in digital form, to be traded in digital form. Mm. But to be able to pay for a digital asset, you have to have digital money. And so it'll be the development of digital assets that will probably drive digital money, as opposed to our ability to pay for coffee faster in the morning. So that was one of the takeaways. The other takeaway is that we need to be thinking about public goods. 
what is the basic public good that the central bank needs to offer? And the takeaway was that it's, it's a platform, a platform on which the private sector can tokenize money, a platform on which the private sector can tokenize assets, and uh, a platform where the private sector can program. And giving that uh, a, a unitary platform to end users, to the markets, uh, will uh, greatly increase efficiency. So what's the IMF's role in all of this? The IMF is really stepping up its efforts uh, in uh, the area of digital money. Um, we've received a structural augmentation of the budget. A little noisy for a second. I'm going to ask you to speak up just a little bit, Samantha, so while we get the rock the stars, music. The yes, rock stars the rock are stars coming off the, the stage. <laughs> Um, so the IMF is, is really uh, ramping up its efforts. And uh, why? Because of its membership. There is strong demand by the membership for the IMF to have clear advice in the area of digital money um, with a focus on macroeconomic policy, monetary stability, financial stability, financial inclusion as well. Uh, that is our space, uh, policy implications of digital money. So we're active in central bank digital currency, the CBDC that we just discussed. We're active in uh, privately issued money, the crypto assets, how to regulate. Uh, and we're active, of course, in the cross-border payment space, which is also very important for financial inclusion, we just heard now. And I would just like to end by saying that the IMF cannot do it alone. It's ramping up its efforts, it's very serious about this, it's investing heavily, but it needs to cooperate with other institutions such as the BIS, the World Bank just across the street, the FSB, and together, by each focusing on our mandate, we'll be able to help our membership in the area of digital money. It really sounds like it's evolving. Tommaso, thank you so much for explaining it so well. <laughs> now, also today, the annual meetings plenary brought together all 190 countries of the IMF it took place this morning, and right after that, the IMFC plenary set the work of the IMF for the next year. There was also an important signing ceremony between the European Union and IMF, delivering on the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. And the New Economy Forum wrapped up, as well as that seminar series. Now, let's start with the Managing Director's presentation to the annual meetings plenary. What we are experiencing is a fundamental shift from a period of relative stability, low rates, low inflation, to a period of high rates, high inflation, much greater uncertainty. And this comes as climate disasters became far more frequent and more extreme and geopolitical tensions make global cooperation far harder. We are entering a new dangerous zone, a world that is more fragmented, more fragile, and more prone to shocks that can quickly knock countries off course, often though of no fault of their own. The director delivered those remarks. She was off to the IMFC plenary. And once that wrapped up, she and IMFC chair Nadia Calvino held a press conference to share their thoughts. And the chair minced no words when talking about the global economic picture. The war is the single most important element slowing down growth and generating inflation, volatility, energy and food insecurity and uncertainty. People matter. Uh, we need to deal with what's urgent without losing sight of what is important. Now, some major progress during these meetings was the funding of the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. It's one of the many efforts by the IMF and its membership to help countries most in need. And today, the European Union committed 100 million euros to help. This is what makes it possible for the fund to step up support for our most vulnerable members. And uh, it could not be timelier since so many countries and so many people are facing 
food and energy insecurity, primarily driven by a senseless war that is now taking place in Europe, Russia's war against uh, uh, Ukraine. I spoke with the EU Commissioner for Internal Partnerships, Jutta Erpelainen, immediately after the signing and asked her, what are the Trust's goals? I want to highlight that the most vulnerable countries in the world are facing multiple crises. Uh, of course, they are still covering, recovering from the COVID. They are now facing energy crisis, food security crisis, also because of the war. And, and that's why we, the European Union, wanted to contribute to the IMF's poverty reduction and uh, growth trust in order to provide more fiscal space to our partner countries. What does it mean? It means that through this 100 million euros contribution to this uh, poverty reduction and growth trust, uh, IMF is able to provide uh, access to uh, concessional uh, uh, funding to the most vulnerable countries up to 600 million euros. So it means that we are really able to uh, provide more cost con concessional funding and financing to the most vulnerable countries. And obviously this is a big moment, a significant moment. Can you just outline the kind of gravitas of this? Well, this is an important moment because we know that so many, the most vulnerable countries, especially low uh, and, and also middle income countries, are struggling uh, with their fiscal space. They don't really uh, have uh, opportunities, you know, to, to finance the public services and public goods uh, in, in their own society. So they need support from the international community. Uh, European Union, uh, especially our member states, have been very active uh, when it comes to uh, on lending, on uh, SDRs. But in addition to that, this trust is so important because we are able to provide access to concessional uh, financing uh, to the most vulnerable countries. And uh, of course, we do many other things as well, but- uh, I was going to ask you that. So other measures, what other measures are, is the EU implementing when it comes to trying to reduce poverty in these low income countries? We do a lot, we do a lot. So this uh, today's contribution is only one part of our big uh, package of different measures and tools. Um, one very concrete uh, area where we are active is food security. Mm. So we are investing in food production capacities in the most vulnerable countries uh, in order to strengthen their resilience and autonomy uh, to produce more food for their citizens because uh, still they are very dependent on the import, for instance, of many countries in Africa. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we are also investing in education because that's the most transformative tool to be used in, in, in every society. We have to empower uh, children and young people and we can do that through education. So that's why we decided to increase our external funding uh, from 7% to 13% on education. So 30% of our uh, every uh, all uh, external funding goes now to education projects. And I think in the country like Niger, where the half of the citizens are under 15 years old. So access to quality education is so important. Big, significant move here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, close followers of IMF press conferences and public statements will be very familiar with my next guest. For the past 16 years, he's been responsible for getting the IMF's key messages out there. Now, during that time, he's faced a barrage of challenging questions, but today, I think I'll give him a break because Jerry Rice, the esteemed director of the IMF's communications department, is retiring. Jerry joins me now. That's right, Amanda. Now, can I first of all ask you about, before we get into, I want to hear more about your plans and what's happening there. But first of all, these meetings, back in person, it's a very challenging time that we're in, in terms of the global economy. What has it felt like this week in these buildings? Maybe the word I would use, uh, Amanda, is uh, powerful. Mm. I think these have been a powerful set of meetings because, as you say, it's been such a 
challenging time for the world and for the member countries of the IMF. And so I think for everyone to come together here, the 190 to come together here and get to discuss those issues and talk about how to address them and how to move forward. It has felt um, like there's a power in that, that there's momentum in that. And I think it does show the value of having these meetings and having people come together in this way. And the increased energy from having busy rooms, which, you know, we weren't allowed busy rooms for so long, were right. we? Does it make a difference? Yeah, that's been notable. Uh, I think the, uh, the energy, as you say, that comes from that, from seeing each other in person, you know, from uh, the random bumping into people in corridors, on stairwells, in elevators, and those little snippets of conversations that take place, in many ways are as valuable as some of the set piece discussions that we have. And you learn so much, we spark each other so much. And it struck me that really that's what's been missing the last three years. So hopefully we're back. Very much so. Now, you have seen your fair share of meetings, haven't you, over the years? That's, just, that's an understatement. Yeah, that's an understatement. So just tell me, it's a tough question, but how have you seen things change over those years? Just in terms of, you know, everything from the way we are much, so much more digital these days to also the representation in the room, that kind of thing. Uh, the word um, revolution comes to mind. There's been a revolution. From, from the old uh, days of the annual and spring meetings, which um, were, used to be very staid, mm. uh, you know, very uh, closed meetings. It was the officials and the non-official groups were outside the building. And so you didn't have the same openness, sense of inclusion. You didn't have the same sense of real debate and discussion going on. 300 civil society organizations in the IMF for these meetings, that was unheard of even 10, 15 years ago. And you know, we're sitting here just watching uh, one of our seminars and we didn't have seminars. So um, it's really uh, quite different. Um, I, I was coming back with the managing director from a press conference today and there was dancing and sing, singing going on at the IMF, believe it or not folks, dancing and singing <laughs> going on at the IMF because we're going to Marrakesh next year and we had the Moroccan uh, delegation showing us some of their wonderful culture and everyone was, uh, was getting into that. Are you going to miss these meetings? I think you are, based on what you said to me. How do you feel knowing this is your last one? Do you think you'll pop sneak in to the spring meetings? As no. A, no? You're going to, right? No. Okay. No sneaking in, Amanda. <laughs> no sneaking in at the IMF. No, absolutely. That's true. <laughs> but seriously, I will miss the buzz mm. right behind us here. Incredible. The, uh, the diversity of people the diversity of ideas, uh, perspectives, just fantastic, the excitement of that. But I will not miss the pressure and the stress that sometimes yeah. comes along with the responsibility that the IMF has, especially in times of crisis, to work as hard as we possibly can and do as much as we possibly can to help the membership. There's a pressure and a stress that comes with that and uh, I've been doing that a long time. So uh, I'm looking forward to a little bit of uh, relief from that part, but I'm gonna miss the buzz, you're right. Well, that's my next question. What, what are your plans? Are you going just full kind of books, fishing, relaxation, or are you gonna keep your hand in? And... Um, Sleeping. Sleeping, yeah, that's a good idea. I've been known as Mr. 24 7 right. for quite a long time. So, uh, some sleep, some rest. Um, I am a terrible guitar player. And I want, I've actually heard that and I want you're to a improve, very good guitar player. I want to improve my guitar playing. 
Um, I swim every day, uh -huh. so I'm going to do even more swimming mm -hmm. exercise. And I'll probably do a little bit of, I want to do a little bit of writing, thinking, and um, you know, a little bit of this and that. If someone needs help with, uh, with communication here and there, then uh, I might be uh, able to uh, help them a little bit. Well, you've got plenty of experience to offer. And that, that brings me to my next question. We are in a time of crisis at the moment, but there have been other times of crisis. We've talked a lot about whether anyone's got any optimism. I've heard that question a lot during this week. Do you have optimism having seen previous crises come and go and things do usually recover? Can we go that far? Well, if my experience is anything to, to go by, that's right we will get through this. This too shall pass, as uh, someone once said. But um, this one right now is, uh, as Kristalina Georgieva has said, the difference is it's a crisis upon crisis upon crisis. Uh, you know, if you think about the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, we've got inflation, the cost of living crisis. And that makes it um, more worrying and more difficult. But we've seen really difficult crises before and we've gotten through them. And it brings me back to the IMF and these meetings and people coming together to get through them. I think if we cooperate, work together, think about each other, care for each other, and I mean that in terms of countries as well as people, then we'll get through it. Human beings are incredibly um, ingenious and creative, and um, we, I believe we will get through it. And you know better than most that this isn't just about talks and panels inside these buildings. This has a huge ripple effect across the world and impacts lives. The, the work that's yeah. and discussions that, are, yeah. that take place here. Well, that's right. I mean, you've got every, virtually every central bank governor and finance minister in the world right here for two days. So they're all talking to each other. That's potentially an incredible impact. Mm. And, you know, we even had the Secretary General of the UN here today. He came to our uh, governing body, the IMFC, he came to uh, that meeting today and again that signals, I think, what you're saying, just the, it brings me back to the beginning, the potential power of uh, what, what can happen at these meetings. Yeah. Well, Jerry Rice, we wish you all the very best for what I'm sure will be hopefully a relaxing future, a little less stress, a little more sleep. Good luck with everything. Thanks so much for joining us on IMF today. Thank you, Amanda. So tomorrow at 1 p.m., right here behind me in this atrium, it's the Per Jakobsen Lecture. This year, we're examining the importance of globalization in addressing climate change. Follow the live conversation between Guillermo Ortiz, chairman of the Per Jakobsen Board, and Raghuram Rajan, professor of finance at the University of Chicago. Now, the urgency of the moment we're in, coupled with being back in person, has created, as Jerry was saying, a real energy inside these buildings. The buzzwords, of course, have been debt, inflation, climate change, but there's also been talk of supporting each other, working together, and maybe even a tiny hint of optimism. Thank you so much for joining us for the annual meetings and IMF today. And thank you to all the brilliant people in every corner of these buildings making it all work. We'll leave you with some of our favorite images from throughout the week. Have a great weekend.